I'm Alicia Wolf, also known as the Dizzy Cook, and I am here today with my own neurologist, Dr. Shin Bay of the Bay Center for Vestibular and Migraine Disorders in Texas. And we are here to talk about all things the vagus nerve, vagus nerve stimulation, natural migraine treatments, um, the Mediterranean migraine diet, our new cookbook, and uh, all your questions that you either submitted ahead of time or if we can have, if we have time, we'll get to some more um, later on. So feel free to hold your questions till the end of the presentation. Yep. <laughs> and we will try to get to them as we can. But want to start off a little bit with my story, if you don't know me, as well as your story. <laughs> <laughs> so about six years ago, I started feeling uh, sensations of dizziness. I felt like I was walking on clouds or marshmallows. Um, I would have trouble with my vision. Uh, my eyes felt tired all the time. I was having all these symptoms with light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, but I had no head pain. So I went to several different neurologists around Dallas, um, ENTs, vestibular therapists, and everyone diagnosed me with everything from anxiety and depression to uh, vestibular neuritis to a potential paralympistula. And what's so special about Arizona for me was my husband actually drove me 16 hours out here because I had this potential paralympistula and couldn't fly um, to go to the Mayo Clinic. And I saw an EMT there who specialized in paralympistula and he actually said, no, this is migraine. And I said, migraine? I, I'm not getting any headaches. And he said, oh, actually, this is a type of migraine called vestibular migraine. And it occurs with or without uh, head pain. So this blew my mind because as like most people in this world, we all think of um, a, lo a lot of people who don't understand or don't live with it imagine migraine to be just a headache. But it's so much more than that, as I know, as a lot of us here know. So uh, he said, I can't help you because this isn't my expertise, so you gotta find a doctor who knows something about this. Well, conveniently, I had been on this wait list for the dizzy doctor, <laughs> who is now sitting right next to me. And I think that week I called and uh, you had fit me in uh, during a lunch period or something like that. And I got in, um, I, it was like a six month wait list and I got in a little bit earlier. And uh, you went through all these tests with me and you said, oh yeah, vestibular migraine. And so you explained everything to me in detail and it was at that <clears throat> point that I really started to believe, oh, okay, maybe this is a thing for me. Yep. <laughs> so it's been six years now living with this illness and uh, I have gone from 24 seven chronic symptoms, dizziness, uh, all these weird things, vertigo, um, just not being able to drive, barely being able to walk, to sitting here with all these lights around us, <laughs> be, traveling three times this week. Um, and a lot of that is thanks to your treatment plan that really helped me as well. So we'll kind of go through some of that today, but Absolutely. let's talk about your experience and how you got into treating <laughs> all things vestibular. I'll pick up from where she left off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my fellowship training was a bit in multiple sclerosis, neuroimmunology, dizziness, combination of the two. When I came back to Dallas, when I first met you, mm -hmm. I was still fairly early in my career and I thought I was going to spend more time in the multiple sclerosis world. Right, I did dizziness maybe, you know, half a day to one day per week. But then after a while, I realized there are a lot more dizzy people than multiple sclerosis <laughs> patients. And there are barely any neuro uh, neurologists that see them. No right? one. And so, you know, then I shifted my focus. The surprising part has been migraine, right? Years ago, we wouldn't have really suspected that migraine would manifest with dizziness, with vertigo. But I think as time has gone by, although this is something that the ancient Greeks had already recognized, that you can get vertigo with a migraine attack, I think the recognition of vestibular migraine as an entity, as a clinical diagnosis, has really began to uh, take root. 
right? If you look at the number of publications that you know, have vestibular migraine as a topic, you see this huge increase in the 2000s. Before that, there was barely anything that was being published about uh, vestibular migraine. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, <laughs> and here we are now, right? You know, yeah. learn so much you know, from our patients and uh, from Alicia. Right? Yeah. Treatment wise, you know, it's always been a journey. As long as something is safe, you know, as something is, uh, you know, potentially effective, we try it out and that's how we learn. And today we'll talk more about that. Awesome. So we're going to actually start <laughs> with a little presentation on the vagus nerve. So can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about what the vagus nerve is? So the vagus nerve is one of the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are basically the nerves that come out from your brain, exit through a hole in your skull, and connect to a particular structure. Some of the cranial nerves control smell, eye movements, eyesight, sensation on your face, movement on your face. The vagus nerve is the largest of the lot. So it starts in your brainstem, travels down your neck, and goes to many different organs of the body. So it goes to your gut, your lungs, your heart. The connections with the gut are the most interesting one because you know we always talk about the gut-brain axis, how the gut and the brain interact with each other. And one of the means that it interacts with the brain is through your vagus nerve. Your brain can tell your gut what to do, and your gut can tell your brain what to do through your vagus nerve. Um, the vagus nerve basically the functions of the vagus nerve. So you know you have some of the more important ones, like it, or the obvious ones rather, like the ones that control coughing, swallowing, your vocal cords, and you have some that are very important but you don't see, which is controlling your heart rate, controlling your blood pressure, urination, digestion, movement in your gut, and all of that interesting functions for the vagus nerve that we don't really think about but we're learning more about is it can influence your mood it can change you know anxiety depression there are studies looking at post-traumatic stress disorder and vagus nerve function and more interestingly it also has an effect on your immune system mm. so you know it can have some anti-inflammatory functions to it um, and it's an interesting study going on in uh, long COVID and vagus nerve stimulation yeah that uh, will be really interesting to see <laughs> Um, how does it relate specifically to migraine? So initially it was approved, the vagus nerve stimulator, gamma cord advice was approved for people with uh, migraine headache. Right? The, a lot of the information came from a few case studies, I think one case study actually, where the vagus nerve stimulator for a patient with epilepsy didn't really help the epilepsy, but helped his migraine. And so from there, they kind of realized, as many things like that happen in medicine, right? Botox, for example. You know, initially, <laughs> yeah. Botox was given for cosmetic reasons. And then people you know, who lost their wrinkles also found that their migraines got better. And so they took Botox and went, oh, here we go. Let's treat migraine. Same thing with the vagus nerve stimulator, right? So you know, initially, vagus nerve stimulation was for epilepsy. And then it's found to help with migraine. And now we have the gamma core device. How it helps specifically with migraine is interesting. We suspect, suspect. Okay. Right? that it could be from its interactions in the brainstem. So the brainstem is the part of the brain that connects the top, the thinking part of your brain, to your spinal cord. Very important part of the brain. There's a lot of um, centers in that uh, area that control your breathing, your heart rate, basically the stuff that is important for survival. There's a nucleus in the brainstem where the vagus nerve, your vestibular nerve, and your trigeminal nerve all interact with each other. We believe that it helps in migraine headache through that nucleus, right? So as you stimulate the vagus nerve, that alters the activity within that nucleus, and then that alters the activity in the trigeminal system helping the headache. It can also influence activity in your vagus nerve and help with vertigo, dizziness, and in the two systems for vestibular migraine. Okay, so. what about specifically for people who have nausea with their attacks, especially vestibular <laughs> patients? I know I get a vertigo attack <clears throat> and yeah, it's not, it's not good. So Absolutely. is this something that could be helpful? Absolutely, so the vagus nerve is very important. It's part of the vomiting reflex. Right, and it plays oh. an important part in nausea as well. Okay. So if you think about when you vomit, what happens is your palate, there's changes in the movements of your palate, you know, your throat. The vagus nerve is an important function of that. So it can help with nausea, whether it's from migraine or not. Now, it's not FDA approved, or that's an important point to point out. Mm -hmm. But you know, anecdotal evidence from my patient population, you know, it shows that it can help with nausea. Okay. So I've had a few patients, you know, come to the clinic, you know, you've undergone the neurological exam, I subject you to cruel and unusual punishment, some people <laughs> yeah. call that, where, you know, we shake you around a little bit, tip you over the bed, <laughs> you know, do all kinds of things to you, right? To diagnose what's going on, 
right? And a lot of people do get nauseous, and I found that you know a quick way to treat it is zap them in the clinic. Oh, that's really smart. Yeah. <clears throat> and then they can see if it works too. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, that brings me to my next question. Is gamma core successful for vestibular migraine or is it just for any type of migraine? So it's approved for migraine headache, okay. but as with a lot of treatments for migraine that we take and apply to vestibular migraine, same thing with the gamma core. Yeah, we don't get yep. a lot of studies for vestibular migraine, exactly. but you did so, do one. <laughs> we, we hijack a lot of the uh, stuff that they give for migraine, they approve for migraine. Yeah. We take it, we see if it works in vestibular migraine. So the gamma core was one of that too. Okay. So one of the case series that we published was for rescue in vestibular migraine. So a bunch of patients that came to a clinic, you know, they were in the midst of the migraine attack, usually this time of year, right? I'm sure all of you know, when the weather is changing, migraines will flare up like crazy. Yeah. And so, you know, when they came in with the uh, vertigo attacks, we applied it to their neck and it seemed to help. Okay. So that's why we learned. Okay, but it could be useful for any type of migraine, and specifically for <clears throat> migraine headache as well. Yep. Um, how does this differ from trigeminal nerve stimulation? You kind of touched on that. They're connected yep. a little bit, but... So trigeminal nerve stimulation tri stimulates the trigeminal nerve itself. The trigeminal nerve is the nerve that supplies sensation in your face, the top part of your scalp, uh, supplies your jaw muscles too. The, if you stimulate the cephaly device, right? Mm -hmm. So it stimulates the trigeminal nerve right on the forehead. So it's the V1 branch of your trigeminal nerve. Um, that doesn't affect the vestibular nerve. Okay. So, sorry, that doesn't affect the vagus nerve. That can affect the vestibular system, but it cannot affect the uh, vagus nerve directly that we know of, right? So if you're wanting to stimulate the vagus nerve, then you need the uh, vagus nerve stimulator. Okay. Yep. But both devices can be used for vestibular migraine. Yeah, we actually talked <coughs> about that in our last presentation. You can actually <coughs> use both devices for different things. Exactly. So, um, what, what's the difference between natural vagus nerve stimulation and a device like GammaCore? So the natural methods, you know, I think we touched on that briefly the last time. So yeah. exercise, yoga, meditation, humming, dunking yourself in cold water, all of those can also stimulate the vagus nerve. There, to my knowledge at least, there's no study to show if there's a difference between the two. I would say the good thing about using a device like the Gamma Core is that you get at least some consistency with it, okay. right? Um, you know, humming, for example, may different, each of us will hum at different pitches, different <laughs> volumes, and so that may affect the vagus nerve differently. Our styles of meditation too would be a little bit different from each other, and so that also may affect the vagus nerve differently. Um, if you talk about like, oh, chanting is another one, so okay. where you slow your breathing down a little bit uh, to about six breaths per minute, that can also influence the vagus nerve and increase its activity. But I think those measures differ in each person. Um, a more consistent ways to use, you know, a device like that. Yep. Could you yeah. do both together? Absolutely. <laughs> yep. yeah, I think my humming all the time would actually give me a migraine attack. <laughs> for... <laughs> it'll, it'll give Casey a migraine yeah. attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, might, might want to stay away from that one. <laughs> um, can, who is this good for and who should not try it? So anyone with migraine, anyone with vestibular migraine, I think could be a good candidate for you know, the vagus nerve stimulator. Um, it's a reasonable option, it's a very safe option, it's a very flexible option. Mm -hmm. You can use it preventively, you can use it for rescue. Um, and for rescue, you can zap yourself at the beginning, 20 minutes later, half an hour later, you can repeat that. Um, Safety-wise, super safe from what I can tell so far. The main thing, you, the main, the main pers uh, people who should avoid it is if you have very low heart rate, because the vagus nerve uh, stimulation can reduce your heart rate. If your blood pressure is on the low side, you may want to be a little bit careful with it. Okay. And if you have any implanted devices in your neck, especially. Okay. Right? If you have a pacemaker, definitely don't do it. We don't want to interfere with a pacemaker. Um, if you've got any metallic devices in your neck, I would advise against that too. Yeah, we had a question about if you can use it with an implanted neurostimulator. Probably shouldn't, depending on the location, right? If your, if your stimulator is on your lower back, for example, like a pain stimulator, I imagine that would be safe, okay. right? But if it's like higher up, like say if you're in like a pacemaker or something in the neck, I'd stay away from the, uh, you know, gamma core. Okay. Yep. And can you explain a little bit about using it acutely and as a preventative? So for people who don't know what a preventative and acute treatment 
kind of touch on that and yep. then how Gamma Core applies? Absolutely. So preventive treatments for migraines are treatments that you use on a regular basis. You do, you do that every day, several times per day for some of those treatments. The goal of those treatments would be to reduce the number of migraine attacks over time, to reduce the daily symptoms that you have. Rescue treatments, on the other hand, are used when you have a migraine attack. So when your symptoms flare up, that's when you use your rescue treatments. Okay. Yep. So I am actually a Gamma Core patient. Uh, I started this postpartum. I was really struggling with postpartum anxiety. And we had kind of set together a plan for me um, after I had my first child, just in case things went haywire. And things did go haywire because <laughs> I wasn't sleeping. And sleep is one of my biggest triggers. And so I remember, I think I emailed or called you. I can't quite, I, I don't remember exactly what was said, but we had discussed a few different things and uh, went back to some of the treatments that worked for me previously. But because um, my OB didn't want me, one of them was the Timolol eye yep. drops, but because my OB didn't want me to, um, wanted to watch my blood pressure, especially immediately after giving birth, um, Gamma Core mm. was something we tried. and. Yep. That was, uh, you know, it was kind of said, oh, this could help with some of the stress, anxiety, sleep, all the things. Um, so that's when I started it as an acute and preventative treatment. And it was actually something that's helped me a lot. I've continued to use it this entire time. Um, and it's been a great treatment during pregnancy that all my OB and everyone has approved. Um, so it's been working out really well for me, especially as someone who has developed high perinesis gravidarum, which is extreme nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. So uh, because of the gut-brain connection here and its effect on nausea, I know we bumped up some of my treatments yep. <laughs> and it seems to be really effective. So just some good information to add in there. I'm actually gonna demo it for you guys today because I know we have a lot of people who are curious how this how this goes, how, the, how it looks. I'm hoping it doesn't interfere with my microphone. But basically they supply this electro gel. You get a card with a refill for three months. I think some people can do a year, a maybe year. if they're your yep. patient, um, something to ask your doctor. So you basically turn it on and it, it tells you how many sessions you have um, left in the month and the day. So typically it gives you 30 sessions a day or 30 zaps as Dr. Bay likes to call them. <laughs> <laughs> I've never gotten close to using all my 30 zaps. Um, I've maybe like 10 in a day is the most <laughs> I've done, but uh, basically you should be covered for a day of using it, especially as an <laughs> acute treatment. So when you turn it on, you just adjust the intensity on it and then try to find, oh, I can feel it right there. So you can do it on both sides of your neck and then you just turn up the intensity on it and it feels a little like a uh, tingling. Tingling. <laughs> and then how you can tell it's working is your lip will start to pull down. So <laughs> it's not, it's harder when you're talking. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I'll do the talking as you do it. So one way you can identify where to put the device is to feel your carotid pulse. You get two fingers, put it on your neck, you feel where the pulse is. That's kind of the, your landmark that you can use. Now, it can be on the right side of your neck, left side of your neck, doesn't matter. The vagus nerve travels down both sides, right? So you find one side, and once you find where the pulse is, mm -hmm. then you get your device, you place it, over that area. It doesn't have to be completely precise because, you know, the electrical signal will travel to the uh, vagus nerve and then you turn it up to a degree where you feel a bit of pooling. So you feel a little bit of muscle tension on that side mm -hmm. and that's it. Don't s squeeze it all the way in, right? So I've had some patients, you know, press, too, press hard. too hard is going to hurt, yeah. right? So place it firmly on your skin, but you don't have to jam it all the way in. No, this yep. is super gentle. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and so you can kind of see how it's pulling a little bit, but it doesn't hurt. And my lip, I promise, will go back to how it looks before. <laughs> then you can adjust the intensity as well. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, uh, you know, turn it like right up to the maximum. I tried the maximum on myself. Not too bad. 
Oh, I haven't done that. A little, That's very brave. A little uh, the pooling can be quite uh, strong, but not horrible. <laughs> yep. I have to test it out so I can tell you what to feel, right? <laughs> That's the thing, if you don't get the pooling, you're probably not stimulating yep. high enough. You so. have to, yep. and you have to use enough of the gel. So like a pea-sized amount on each of the uh, metal uh, electrodes. If you don't use enough of it, the electrical uh, signal won't conduct. Yes, that's yep. a, I have that problem sometimes. Very important point. Very important. Yep. I've seen some people, they don't want to um, mess up, you know, get, get too messy. They just put a little smidge on it, doesn't work. Right? It has to be about a pea-sized amount on each lead. So that's it, just two minutes. Um, you typically, what I would do is stim again on the same side um, for a four minutes total, but that would be one session for me. So for preventative treatment, we do this you know, two to three times a day, yep. maybe even more, um, depending on what your doctor wants. Yeah. But for me, I do it two to three times yep. a day. And then um, acutely, I just do it whenever I, I feel like it, or have an attack, or brain fog, or whatever feel something coming on. Mm. Yep. Um, sometimes it doesn't completely get rid of the symptoms. Other times if it's low enough and I catch it early enough, it will. But if it doesn't completely get rid of symptoms, it will at least decrease them um, to where sometimes the next day I feel fine or I can go about my day. Um, what I really like about this device too is side effects, like you literally saw them. It's just that buzzing and that pooling sensation, yep. that's about it, right? That's you may hear it. some weird things from people. <laughs> I mean, dizziness, some people say dizziness, but dizziness occurs with every single thing. Uh -huh. There's no supplement, medication, treatment on the planet that doesn't cause dizziness, headache, constipation, diarrhea, not enough sleep, too much sleep. Those are common side effects with every single thing. So you may see some of that, right? But generally a very well-tolerated treatment. I think you brought up an important point too. What happens if your symptoms don't get better, right? If you're using it for rescue, what do you do, mm -hmm. right? Use your rescue medications. If you have those medications on, uh, available, you can use them too. Is it safe to combine? Absolutely. Yeah, it can be used with other treatments too, even Excellent. other stimulation devices. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I actually have information on this on my website, <clears throat> but if you're also a patient of Dr. Bay's, he has a really good deal as well. <clears throat> Um, and I also have a discount for Dizzy Cook readers, so either of us can help you out yep. with that. Uh, just talk to your doctor and feel free to email us uh, if you have any more questions about that. And we'll take some questions towards the end, mm. but I hope that was helpful to kind of see <coughs> everything and how it's, how it's done. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our cookbook together. <laughs> and what a Mediterranean migraine diet is. Yep. So now it's my turn to ask her <laughs> questions. <laughs> so first, what's the difference between this book and the Dizzy Cookbook? <laughs> so the Dizzy Cookbook was my first cookbook and it focuses on the Heal Your Headache Diet, which was made famous by um, Dr. David Buckles. Of, um, he was at Johns Hopkins and some people know it as the Johns Hopkins Migraine Diet. It kind of floats around in different areas. Usually your doctor hands you a sheet of paper and just says, oh, do this diet. You didn't do that, but I actually came in with a book and I was like, have you heard anything about this book? And he was like, oh, you know, try it, try it if you want. Um, it can be very difficult to do. And I noticed this as a patient who actually loves to cook. So what I started doing was reading through the book and I was like, well, what about this and what about that? And uh, how do I shop? And I have to read all these labels and there, weren't, there wasn't any resources for products. <laughs> and so for a migraine patient, it's really hard because you're struggling to cook as it is and now you have all these rules. And um, we love you guys, but you're not the best at telling us how to prepare <laughs> things in the kitchen, right? You don't want me giving you a recipe. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> so generally your neurologist is not going to help you with what to make uh, on every night for dinner. And so I kind of saw this as an opportunity with my first book to combine my love for cooking um, with the stuff I was already doing. And I found an elimination diet to be very helpful for me to discover that I did actually have food triggers. Not everyone with migraine has food triggers, but um, you know, a portion of us do or can be affected by certain foods we eat. 
And so it was very effective for me to combine that with my treatment with Dr. Bay, my, my medications and my supplements and lifestyle changes. Um, and that's kind of what I, what really, that change really got me to my disease-free days. And so the first cookbook, The Dizzy Cook, is all about elimination and how to really thrive on elimination diet without feeling restricted. So there's a lot of comfort foods. Um, it follows that elimination structure. And so if your doctor hands you that sheet of paper, it's perfect for that. How this kind of differs is it's more of a long-term way of eating. So elimination diets are very short-term to help you kind of bring, calm your brain down, um, discover if you had those two triggers, and then incorporate foods back into your diet. Where this kind of comes in is it's a lot more scientific based, which it's hard to do scientific studies for elimination because yep. my <laughs> triggers aren't anyone else's triggers. And, <laughs> you know, it's like I, I do fine with chocolate most days, but a lot of people don't. So uh, I think that's where it gets kind of tricky when it comes to studies, but we know a lot about uh, the Mediterranean diet. So maybe you can t speak to some of the science behind this yep. book specifically. Absolutely. So when we were trying to decide, you know, what sort of diet is a good one for the long term, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, an elimination diet is a short term thing. Mm -hmm. We want to control the symptoms, bring it down, but it's a tough diet to be on. Yes. Right? You know, your food has to be prepared fresh and everything, you know, hard to work, you know, and constantly prepare that, uh, that type of diet. And so we wanted something that, you know, has good evidence for the long term something that you can sustain that not only helps with migraine, but can help with many other things as well, can help with your neurological health, can help with cardiovascular health, you know, even lower the risk of certain types of cancers, right? And the one diet that really stood out with proper scientific evidence, not some Dr. Oz type of thing, <laughs> yep, is the Mediterranean diet. So not some kind of fat, right? So not like cabbage soup diet, apple diet, cookie no. diet, none of that, right? <laughs> Want something with proper scientific evidence that you can take, that you can uh, make, uh, put to good use, right? So the whole idea was born for this cookbook, right? <laughs> now, maybe you can tell us, how is it organized? <laughs> <laughs> So it's organized, it kind of tells both of our stories. So it tells a little bit of my journey with migraine as a patient and how I went from elimination to kind of focusing more on a Mediterranean diet way of eating as I continue to improve and get better, as well as your history with yep. treating patients. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of moves into the details of a Mediterranean diet and what that would look like for your average person. But we also talk about common food triggers with people with migraine, but from a perspective that you kind of already know what may bother you or, you know, things to limit or watch overall to make sure that they, you know, aren't yep. an issue for you. Because there are a few things on the Mediterranean diet, like red wine, um, that could potentially be an issue. Tomatoes are something we talk about in here as well. Yep. <laughs> um, and you actually prepared some really interesting evidence <laughs> on tomatoes and their glutamate content. So you can find that all in the book, uh, especially if you find tomatoes to be a trigger. So our main goal was to help you incorporate more foods into your diet. And <clears throat> if you find certain things to be a trigger, hey, maybe look for these types of olives or these types of tomatoes instead of just buying any type of tomato because it can make a difference. Yeah, Absolutely. So, um, so we talk about that uh, and it's, it goes into how to organize your pantry. So I talk a little bit about shopping because I never want you to feel like, oh, here are all these tips of things that I have to do, but I don't know what brands to buy or where to shop. So it kind of talks to you about how to organize your pantry with whole grains. Um, what kind of flowers to buy, what kind of condiments to look for without maybe added sulfites, that sort of thing. And then the recipes are organized by food group that is shown to improve brain health. So every chapter that we talk about, you explain the science behind how these things can help with brain health. And then I go into what to look for, how to shop with yep. it, how to store it, how to cook with it, <laughs> as well as the recipes. So 
for example, berries are yep. something that we start off with and we talk about the antioxidants in the berries and mm. how those are effective for brain health. And then I give you a bunch of different recipes with berries that aren't all breakfast recipes. So, <laughs> <laughs> How easy are the recipes to make? Overall, I tell people this all the time. I developed this cookbook with a new baby, so I would say they're pretty easy if I can do that with a newborn. <laughs> Was it? And I love to cook, so I think I I have more motivation than most people. But I do think if you can prepare them with a new baby, they're they're probably fairly easy. I do think this cookbook is a lot more adventurous than the first cookbook. Um, with the first cookbook, I focused on comfort foods, so things like meatloaf, mac, fresh mac and cheese, no aged cheese. Um, <laughs> and just that comfort those kind of comfort foods whereas with this one the recipes get a little more adventurous but i've been really pleased with the feedback that people have been trying some of these interesting ones i haven't seen anyone made the make the whole roasted branzino yet so i'm waiting for someone <laughs> i might give like a prize to the first time the person who sends me that picture <laughs> but i think that's probably the most complicated one on there <laughs> interesting oh. so even somebody like me who can burn water while i boil it can yes. use the book yeah <laughs> You can at least make some of the salads, then you don't have to, then you don't have to turn on the water at all. Too. <laughs> um, another point to this we, that I really wanted to focus on um, was to make edits for people who are dairy-free, gluten-free, vegetarian. Mm. Um, both cookbooks are about 70 to 80% vegetarian recipes or easy to edit but there are little icons on it if you can edit. And so um, another thing is we, we use some things like citrus, which a lot of people come um, to my site and they're like, you're using a recipe with citrus. It's a common migraine trigger. But for this book, we really wanted you to have more food freedom. And so if you are sensitive to citrus, we, I give you an edit for the recipe, but it's also included as an option yep. for people who don't have that issue. So my hope is that people read the edits. Yep. <laughs> And the good thing about a Mediterranean diet is generally it is a low red meat diet. Yes. It's high in poultry, fish, you know, a lot of uh, vegetables and fruits in the diet. So, Even though nope. we have red meat, these pomegranate skewers on the front um, are, a, it's a really good recipe. My son actually loves it. But we mm. talk a little bit about red meat and yeah. how often to have it and what kind of meat to look for even. Exactly. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? No, I think that's it. Yeah, so you can actually find this. It's available. Um, I still have some signed copies that we've done. So those are available on the dizzycookshop.com. I bet you can get it at your office now. No, no, okay. Come to the Dizzy Cookshop. I haven't got my copies yet. <laughs> Eventually. I'll, um, I'll find to get them somehow. <laughs> it's also available on Amazon, everywhere books are sold. So yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> That's the gist of the diet. Um, I will give you a little bit of a sneak peek here. So um, how it's kind of laid out, why choose a Mediterranean diet for migraine? We have the berry chapter. So here's a pomegranate berry smoothie. Um, I talk about granola. So this is a good point too. Uh, we go into discuss um, nuts and seeds. So nuts, most nuts are actually a trigger for me. So it's a little hard for me to test recipes with them. Um, I found that out through the elimination diet. So I, um, I'll get my ears plug up and get kind of dizzy. So I use a lot of seeds in these recipes, but feel free to sub your favorite nut butters or whatever you like. Um, but this is a quick seed granola that's really delicious. Really important one. Um, this one was actually on my website, but I had to incorporate in my cookbook because a lot of people uh, love this recipe for high nausea days and it's actually helped them decrease uh, symptoms. So if you go through all the comments online, they're like, oh, I love this the, for migraine attack days. So this is a good day for high, a good recipe for high nausea. It's the famous migraine fighting soup smoothie. <laughs> so we have a lot of whole grain salads in here, um, incorporating vegetables where we can, uh, a mushroom for roto. <laughs> 
and uh, lots of seafood in here mm -hmm. as well. So high omega threes. Lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about a little bit about that new study that came out as yep. well um, for migraines. So that was kind of impressive to yep. do that they did a study for diet, right? Yeah, very impressive. The omega three and omega six. I think you know we talk about that a little bit, uh, but it's important to highlight. So the main thing is a diet that is high in omega six versus omega three promotes more inflammation. And unfortunately, that's most of our diets because you get a lot of omega-6 in vegetable oils, right? So almost everything we eat has vegetable oil in it. Whereas if you have a diet that's higher in omega-3 compared to omega-6 fatty acids, then that favors a less inflammatory environment. And that helps with many things, not just with migraine, but can help with cardiovascular health as well, even you know, with a lot of autoimmune type of uh, diseases. Um, now, the interesting thing is, you know, should you buy fish oil? and supplement with fish oil? Yeah, that's a great question. The answer is unfortunately, the data for the studies involving supplements with fish oil, meh, not very impressive. And one of the reasons is you know, the omega-3s that you get from food, if you extract them and you put them in a little capsule, they may not work as well. Mm. So it's better to get it from your food. So eat like the fatty fish, the seeds and all that. Yep, there'll be a better way to get your omega-3s. It's not just salmon either, nope. <laughs> as explained here. Caught many different things. Yeah. Yep. So do, if you hate fish, you can also get omega-3s in other places. Absolutely. I think that's a good point. <laughs> so we, we talk a little bit about eggs as yep. well as a good source. Um, and then move into some of the few recipes with some healthy lean red meat, uh, as well as some poultry recipes too. So. Yep. That's kind of the gist of the cookbook. And we'll transition into some of your questions. Um, I will go ahead and ask, is it, so these were submitted ahead of time. Maybe some of you mm. submitted some of these. Um, and then we will answer any yeah. other ones that let's come do, across. Let's do five and then have our audience bring okay, up questions. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So this is a good question for both of us, I think. <laughs> is it possible for vestibular migraine to cause symptoms 24-7? I think the best way to illustrate that is for you to tell us your symptoms, <laughs> right? It's a, a good case study, right? So yeah. kind of take us through you know, the symptoms that you were having in the beginning, and so that way we can illustrate how yes. that can work. So how my symptoms kind of started was I had this low-level dizziness in my head that just was annoying. It felt like my head was sort of floaty or that there was buzzing, brain fog. Now I know the term, but I had a lot of that. I didn't really have a way to describe it. But that was every day for me. Um, it eventually transitioned to where I was getting vertigo attacks every so often, uh, where we had to go to the ER one night because I was having that room spinning vertigo and I was like, what is going on? Um, the walking on marshmallows, it wasn't totally constant, but it was pretty consistent that I felt like that occurred. Um, as things progressed and I wasn't having treatment, I started having more episodes where I would have some disassociative symptoms or like one time I was in the car with my coworkers and I was in park and I slammed on my brakes because I felt like we were shooting forward and I thought I was going to hit the wall and they all looked at me like I was nuts <laughs> and so I that's when I really was like okay I need some serious help with this because my brain is going crazy um, eventually this lightheadedness the dizziness and everything started to morph into these more scary symptoms so the vertigo attacks the light sensitivity was pretty constant for me the sound sensitivity and yep. that walking so that's a very, really, really good way to describe the symptoms. Yeah. So think of migraine not as a headache only. That's the first thing. Think of migraine not as discrete attacks mm -hmm. only. Right? Migraine is more of a state of the brain where you know, if you think of it like dials, right? the dials are turned just way too high. And so you know, it depends on which part of your brain is affected. Sometimes it affects the, you know, the parts of your brain that deal with, say, vision. And so you experience visual symptoms, say light sensitivity. Some people get the blurry vision. Some people get visual snow, where everything looks kind of like static, the little bugs flying around your vision all the time. Yeah. It affects the balanced parts of your brain, then dizziness, 
this, you know, vertigo can be the manifestation. It's not uncommon, like she described, to have symptoms almost every single day. Are you having a migraine attack every day? No. But you can have some degree of symptoms every day on top of discrete attacks that come and go. So I never really, I felt like I was constantly yep. having mm. symptoms. I never really could distinguish one attack from the next. Um, especially when people talk about the four stages of yep. migraine, I'm like, it just felt all the time to me. <laughs> so I think that's where 24 sim yep. seven symptoms come in. And then there's also the triple PD component, exactly. which could occur as well. Yep. So if you have a different condition, say like triple PD or persistent postural perceptual dizziness, together with your vestibular migraine, then you have different sets of symptoms. You have something, a baseline of dizziness all the time with attacks that come and go. Yeah, so it yep. can be a little confusing. To can be. So you think <laughs> you need to talk about that with your you know, physician, yeah. kind of help them, you know, it'll help you tease everything out to determine, you know, what's causing what. Okay, perfect. Yep. I hope that answered everyone's question. Um, has Gamma Core been able to help patients that have only gotten worse from migraine medications and vestibular rehab therapy? This is another good point. Is it possible for the device to make my dizziness get permanently worse? It's two sets of questions. Two there. sets. There. Two <laughs> sets. There. Yep. So don't think of the device as some miraculous thing. There's, there are no miraculous treatments here. Yeah. There's nothing, you know, no silver bullet that will vanquish all your symptoms. If there were, my life would be much easier. <laughs> like, oh, you, you got vestibular so migraine? <laughs> Take this. This will cure you, right? It'll make life much easier. Yeah. Right? But unfortunately, there isn't. Everyone is different. We are all unique, like snowflakes. And so, you know, genetically, we respond to things differently. So it doesn't mean that, you know, if you fail all the medications, that the gamma core will be your savior. Could it be an option? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Will it work for you? We don't know. It could. A good chance it will, like as with every treatment, but there's no guarantees, unfortunately. Right? Mm -hmm. Can it make your dizziness permanently worse? I have not seen anyone with that so far. Okay. Oh. So I haven't heard of any cases where that's permanently worse. I've had a few people say they feel a little more, you know, lightheaded after they use it. Not a lot, very few, um, but not permanently worse. Okay. Yep. Um, I think for me, you know, it was really about layering. So I, there wasn't any one thing. Everyone asked me, what was the one thing? If you could do one thing, what would it be? And I said, I don't even know because I did so many things. And it was just the layering and trying so many different things. Like this didn't work for, like um, B2 is something that I don't find to be super effective for yep. me. Some mm. people love it. Yep. Uh, magnesium is super effective for me and I take three different kinds and I would mm. gladly take more, but not for everyone, you know? <laughs> I've seen magnesium make some people worse. Yes. <laughs> yep, it actually aggravates the symptoms in some people, which again, it's like, you know, you're not something we expect or yeah. melatonin. It makes some people better, makes some people worse, as with every treatment, yeah. unfortunately. So it's unfortunately a lot of testing that goes into it and trialing. Yep. Um, the good news is with Gamma Core, you are, it's a three month trial, which is actually really helpful because I think a lot of people take new medications or start a new treatment and they think it should work right away. And I see this a lot with diet changes too. Um, people are like, oh, I've been on the diet for a week and I, I'm not, I feel worse. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and generally, I think it takes three to four months to even see changes. You've even yep. said longer for some treatments as well. Correct. Yep. <laughs> so time is a big factor as well. Yep. Um, I also want to mention vestibular therapy. So I was actually doing vestibular mm. therapy before I saw Dr. Bay and only getting worse. And my brain was much too sensitive to be doing vestibular therapy, um, especially with a therapist who didn't really understand vestibular migraine. So uh, that's also a good point to discuss yep. with your physician as well and mm -hmm. see if you're ready. Absolutely. Yeah. When yep. do you usually recommend that for patients? Depends on how you present. I mean, if it's like really bad in the beginning, uh -huh. you know, if even the slightest movement, you know, makes you like really dizzy and it can be a little tough to start at that point in time. Um, usually once, you know, things start to cool down a bit, 
and you're able to tolerate some, then it's more useful. Okay. Yep. It's kind of like you know, if you injure a joint, right? In an yeah. acute phase of uh, the uh, injury, you know, the orthopedic surgeon will tell you, don't do anything, don't just let the joint recover. Yeah. And then once things start to recover, then you get a little bit of light exercise going to you know get the joint healthy again. So same thing. Yeah, and that's how it was effective yep. for me too. I think I incorporated probably a year and a half into treatment before I went on a Vegas trip. Yep. And my vestibular therapist at UT Southwestern had me look at a bunch of people walking through Vegas casinos um, <laughs> and different levels of intensity. And it actually helped a lot yep. with the carpets and the flashing. And yeah, so that's kind of how we built up my, my therapy on that. Ah. <laughs> um, okay, so we have our CGRP medications and Botox truly the best way to manage vestibular migraine. Um, this person feels as though their neurologist has given up on them after a severe la relapse of symptoms. Hmm. So there's no single best medication or medication combination, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? The CGRP uh, antibodies, uh, Botox, they do work, right? Yeah. Are they the best thing around? No. Right. There are many other things that can work. Um, you know, the important thing is, you know, if you have a relapse in the symptoms, to figure out what caused it, perhaps, yeah. and then try to address that. If it's, you know, medication failure, you know, then we have to uh, stop those medications, try something different. I mean, I think this is also a good point. In my own journey, I've had periods where I didn't see you for a year, year two years, or something like that. Yep. And then I get pregnant, or I go through IVF, and I have to come back in and make an appointment. You know, migraine, it's frustrating, but it is a chronic illness, and you do have to manage it even when you don't have symptoms sometimes. And it's just that consistency that can often yep. be effective long term, or sometimes you have to change things. They Absolutely. They don't work like they yep. did before. Um, can I go into remission without medication and only use supplements and natural treatments? That is possible. I do have, I've seen patients who get better mainly with you know, the diet, with the supplements. That is quite possible, yes. Yeah. Yep. How often does that happen? So sampling error, maybe, right? So okay. you know, a lot of the people who come to see me, unfortunately, you know, the symptoms tend to be more severe, yeah. so the proportion is a little bit lower, okay. right? But if we take you know, de novo patients from the community, say, you know, all right, you got vestibular migraine, try these first, I think I suspect the proportion will be higher. Yeah, but, I have a handful of friends who have yep. done it as well, but they had to hit the natural treatments very Hard. strictly, yes. Mm. <laughs> Um, I participated in the virtual presentation before. Um, you mentioned central sensitization. Mm. I had wondered if Gamma Core would be beneficial for someone <clears throat> with central sensitization diagnosis in addition to migraine and dizzy without vestibular migraine. Complicated question. So let's talk about central <laughs> sensitization a little bit. So central sensitization is more known in the pain realm, right? where the brain becomes even more sensitive to anything it can perceive as pain. If you extend it out a little bit, you see that you know, central sensitization encompasses a condition where the brain basically has become so, so sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, there's been ongoing symptoms for a long time. There's no clear answer. And so the brain enters this state where it starts to interpret anything different as a potential problem, right? So that's kind of like the situation some people get where they say, if I eat anything, it makes me dizzy. Yeah. If I eat anything, I feel worse, right? That, you know, you don't have food triggers for every single thing, yes. but there can be a little change in your blood glucose levels when you eat, when you don't eat. And so what can happen in central sensitization syndrome, in that case, right, using that as the illustration, your brain has become so sensitive to any changes in your internal physiology that even minor changes in your blood sugar is interpreted as a potential threat to the body. Right? And so it's a tough, tough, tough condition to be in. Yeah. Right? There's no clear treatments at this point in time. Could vagus nerve stimulation help? Possibly. So, you know, there is a role for the vagus nerve in uh, neuroplasticity, right? So central sensitization is basically bad neuroplasticity where, you know, the brain reinforces this sensitivity and it gets worse and worse and worse. And so you try to introduce good neuroplasticity where it takes that away, right? So vagus nerve stimulation, uh, UT Dallas did a study where they looked at people with ringing in the ears, tinnitus, which is a problem of? 
neuroplasticity. And they looked at patients who were recovering after a stroke. And their device was a bit different from the gamma cord. This was implanted, so wrap some wires around the vagus nerve, have a little device there. Interestingly, they showed that both the stroke patients, while they were doing therapy with vagus nerve stimulation, they got better, faster. Okay. And the patients with tinnitus, the tinnitus went down. So there is a role for it, for sure. How, what the exact efficacy is, we don't know at okay. this time. Interesting, because I do get a lot of people who message me who say, I feel like everything is a trigger for me, yep. and it's not its not possible. Correct. So, well, it is possible for you to feel that way, <laughs> but Correct. not in actuality. So uh, that's something where neuroplasticity you usually recommend to patients as well as some of these vagus nerve stimulations. Correct, huh? yep. Okay. Medications can help, vagus nerve stimulation can potentially help. It can be tough because the medications also cause your body to feel a little different, yeah. And so, you know, a lot of times, because all these act on your brain, migraine comes from the brain, right? And so anything that acts on your brain could potentially make you feel a little bit different. Yep. Okay, okay, that's really interesting. Uh, what are some natural supplements that you recommend for vestibular migraine as well as exercises and how long before you see improvement? I am gonna say, to uh, if you haven't already purchased Victory Over Vestibular Migraine, as well as the Dizzy Cook Cookbook, there's information on both of these in there. A lot of information, yes. <laughs> so supplement-wise, you know, I'll leave it to, you want to tell them about your, the supplements? Okay. And I'll talk about the exercise. <laughs> um, so usually what's most commonly recommended is magnesium uh, B2, which is riboflavin, CoQ10, occasionally ginger, vitamin E, sometimes you've recommended yep. for menstrual migraine. Um, ubiquinol and CoQ10 can kind of be interchangeable. Yep. Like I said, I take three different types of magnesium. So I take magnesium threonate, uh, magnesium citrate, and magnesium glycinate. Um, I find them all to be effective for different things, but that's for me personally. So other people can you know see different yep. results taking different things so it's kind of a little bit of trial and error absolutely um always run all supplements by your physician yep. as well uh i think that's yep. vitamin d yeah also pretty safe vitamin to take d, yeah yep, there's emerged some emerging evidence to show it can help with migraine melatonin can help in some patients as well uh -huh. um, you know fever few you may hear about that as an herb also can potentially help yeah yep. exercises to help with migraine all exercise can help with migraine. <laughs> so physical activity in and of itself can help with migraine. Yeah. Whether it's resistance, whether it involves weights, or whether it's like cardiovascular type of exercises, all can help with migraine. Mm -hmm. If you're dizzy, the ones I usually like to recommend first would be like the yoga, tai chi, the slower type first, right? You know, it can be difficult if you're dizzy to be bouncing up and down, you know, if you're on the elliptical or on the yes. treadmill, right? The weights part, you actually can do it. That doesn't involve a lot of, you know, up and down motion unless you're doing like, you know, uh, CrossFit, for example. Probably want to stay away from that first, but if it's just, you know, weights where you don't have to move around too much, that also can help. Yeah. I actually had to build up to that. So a lot of my initial exercises were just walking. So just mm. walking down the street or taking a walk around the block, um, build that up to eventually, I actually really like Pilates because I can lay down. Uh, I know some people have an issue with laying down, yep. but <laughs> that was kind of nice to feel stable in one, in one area. And uh, yoga was a problem for me because I had trouble uh. bending over but vestibular therapy did eventually yep. help that. Um, but restorative yoga was the type yeah. of yoga I really liked uh, that I could feel supportive where I wouldn't have to do the, the flow and the sun uh. salutations or whatever <laughs> they call it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I've, I've built up to yeah. weights and everything like that, which is, yep. which is really nice. Let's take questions. Yeah, from yep. the audience. Questions, anyone? No one? Oh, here we go. I got a ton of questions. Okay. First of all, thank you guys for coming to this. That was great to see you guys. Um, I'm not sure which one of you can answer this. Do we know why specifically tyranny causes an issue? And then second part of that question would be, are there coping or rescue strategies that you can suggest that we are, what I refer to as being t bomb? Like you're going out to your friend's house and they're cooking, or especially like around the holidays. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be vigilant. You don't know what's mixed into what. And then before you know it, the next morning you feel like 
Mm. So interesting there. So the tyramine issue, the easy answer and the most honest answer is no one really knows. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easiest and the most honest one. But I think if you were to dig deeper into it, the, potential, the most possible explanation is that the tyramine probably causes too much hyperexcitability in the brain. Right? So that is the one. That is also why you know, a lot of foods with a lot of tyramine you enjoy them. They, right? they excite really the uh, taste buds in the mouth. But if you take too much of it, then the brain gets too excitable. Mm -hmm. The brain, you know, migraine already, your brain is so excitable. You put too much in, then it gets too much there. Right? Um, what can we do for cheat days? Right? So like days when you want to go out and eat. Yeah. You can use your <laughs> rescue medications. Yeah. Right? I mean, some, if you're not using your rescue, this is what I tell my patients, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not using your rescue medications, you know, frequently, say, triptans, for example, right? If you're not using them consistently, like almost uh, every few days or so, if you're not, you're not using it for a couple of months, if you want to go out, you want to take one before you go out, why not? If you're the gamma core, try the gamma yeah. core before that, right? If you, if you find that, say, Aleve, um, Tylenol, or one of those work for you as, just as well, you can use that too. Yeah, well, I, I will usually pre either pre-treat, so I'll do <clears> like an extra gamma core stimulation or sometimes you do um, my Timolol eye drops or yeah. something like that before, um, especially if I know I have a big night out uh, or big travel day especially, that's a good one. And then uh, magnesium too, extra magnesium at night or I'll do like a magnesium foot soak um, which it can kind of calm yep. down my brain before bed as well. Make sure I get a really good night's sleep. Uh, but sometimes it's just unavoidable and you do have to take the rescue medications the next day <laughs> as well. It, true. It, it's uh, sometimes worth it. I think yeah. we were talking, um, we were talking before this and I told Dr. Bay how I went on a trip to Spain and we had a big food tour and there was chocolate and aged cheese and and uh, lots of wine and I just went all out because it was a once in a lifetime experience and I paid <laughs> for it uh, the next day. <laughs> I had to take lots of siestas, but sometimes it is yeah. worth it for us to live a little bit. Absolutely. So yeah. the rescue medication is not for you to just have on the counter. Yeah. Right? If you need to use it, you can use it. So to help you basically, you know, live a normal life without worrying about a migraine attack happening. Yeah. No. Try not to plan anything the next day either. Yeah. <laughs> um, as far as entertaining, I usually like to have people over at my house, actually. And I'm sure that's probably because I like to cook. But I can control the food. I can control the lighting. I can control the drinks. It's yep. just a lot easier sometimes, um, especially if you don't think of it as entertaining, but just having a good time with friends. If you do that, it kind of takes some of the stress off. Yes, Jill. Alicia, how long did it take for the gamma core to really make a difference in your vestibular migraine attacks? Um, I would say Alicia, that. Can you repeat that question? Oh yeah. So the question was, how long did it take for gamma core to, for me to notice that gamma core was really making a difference in my migraine attacks? I would say I actually felt almost. I hate telling people this, but I felt almost immediate relief. Um, especially as acute, an acute treatment, not complete relief, but some relief from the dizziness and anxiety especially. Um, but as I've started to use it more consistently or like I contacted you when I was really um, sick with the hyperemesis and we bumped up my treatments two more times a day and that seemed to me more effective. So it, it seems like consistent use, uh, probably about four months or so. I really, really was like, I started to feel like myself again. And I don't know how much of that is hormones changing after postpartum and all that. There's a lot going on, so I hate to tell people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, w I would say consistent use is, is really key, but I did notice immediately relief, yep. yeah. Yes. I was just based on that. Do you does your doctor or your physician have to prescribe how many um, sessions you need a day, or is that card just like loaded and you've got like a 
like I can just go at, you know, like go it's, for it. It's loaded, yeah. It, you should get 30 sessions a day, and I've never gotten close to using <laughs> them all. Um, I wonder if, have, if any of your patients have. Not yet. Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had that many stimulations in a day but that I've had to use. Yeah. Um, but it does come in three-month increments yep. or sometimes a year. A year, yeah. Um, that you can buy. I just have the three months, and so they send me a new card every three months um, with a refill on it. So you get to keep the device, and they just send you the card to upload whenever you want to try it again. So you can always use it for three months. If you don't feel like it's really effective, you can send it back, or you can just order a new refill card. Um, if you don't have a physician to prescribe it, they have an online resource called Vital and someone there will um, be able to help you too. So they could give guidance on how many times you might use it. Yes, exactly. If, you're, if your physician doesn't really know, they should be able to help you with that too. But usually, rec do you recommend the same for everyone? or Three, three times per day minimum. Oh, for minimum. prevention. For prevention, okay. three times minimum. Um, and then if you need it for rescue, Zap more. Okay. See, I was only doing it two, so we had to bump it up to three. <laughs> yes. Hi. I currently use the Cephaly, and I was wondering how would I pair the gamma cord with my current treatment? Like, would I be able to use both in the same day? Yeah, absolutely. The yep. question was um, if you would be able to use gamma core and Cephaly yeah, in the same day. day. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Maybe we thought not at the same time, or I don't know. It's a lot of. <laughs> Zapping. Should be okay at the same time. I don't see a problem with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of like yep. stimulation. Yep. <laughs> I have two questions. My first one is, how much of a factor do you think hormones play in migraines? Because I feel like that's huge. Like that's a lot. Yep. Huge role. Hormones. Hormones play a huge role in migraine. Yeah. Right. If you, if you look at how it manifests at different stages of life, you can see the difference in how the hormones change. Right. So if you think about like you know in childhood before puberty. You typically get, you know, abdominal issues with migraine, nausea, or you get vertigo. That's the manifestation of migraine. Then once you hit puberty, then the boys they tend to drop off. They don't have as many issues, but girls will start to develop the headache part of migraines, right? And then you see as you go through your cycle, some get uh, the more headaches at ovulation. Most people are around the menstrual cycle, and then as you go through, you know, pregnancy, you notice at the beginning, yeah. usually hit or miss in the first trimester, second, third, usually beautiful. And then once you deliver, big drop in hormones, <laughs> yeah. things flare up. And as you go through menopause, or you approach menopause, the headaches tend to get better. But then vertigo comes back and says, hello, remember me? <laughs> yep. So hormones play a huge role in it. Then the second part is, when I've been stuck in one, I've referred to it as like a migraine cycle where I can't get out of it. I've gotten like short-term steroids from doctors. Why do those help? Like what role does that play? Because I feel like a superhuman on them. And like I know mm -hmm. you can't take those consistently. Several factors there. We think one of the issues is the inflammation, right? So steroids, you know, they are really useful medications if you use them in the short term. Mm -hmm. A lot of issues if you take them chronically, right? So in the short term, a little burst of them, there are two things that can happen. Number one, you know, your body may not have enough of its own steroids to cope with the stressful period. So the little extra could help. And they can shut down the inflammatory processes that are involved in migraine. So do we think that that's the uh, reason? Yep. Is, is that why, so we've done a few steroid courses for myself, especially after I've flown and had yep. attacks that I couldn't break with my acute treatments. Um, is it to calm down enough so that your preventative and acute can start to work again, or? It can break the whole cluster. When you okay. enter the whole cluster where the rest, your usual rescues don't work, yeah. the steroids can be part of it. I do a combination of things. Yeah. So there's steroids, there's other medications that I throw in the mix. Each you know, headache specialist or neurologist, they have their own little cocktail that they use. And so you know, okay. steroids usually plays a, one of the roles there. <laughs> okay, that's a really good question. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? We have an online question. Can okay. Gamacore help for kids or adolescents? So it's approved for uh, ages 12 and up. I'm not aware of it being tested in, uh, you know, below age 12. I'm an adult neurologist too, so I don't know, I don't have enough experience in uh, below 12 <laughs> to comment on the gamma core. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bay, does vestibular migraine come from vestibular? central vestibular causes? 
so from the central vestibular structures. Most likely, yeah, we think that that's most likely the case. I think it's a combination of the central trigeminal centers and the vestibular centers. Is there anything that helps with ear pressure that leads to dizziness and migraines? Tough question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough one. So. It depends on the cause of the ear pressure, I would say. So ear pressure can manifest as migraine, right? So if that's the case, if it is a manifestation of migraine, then treating the migraine will help with the uh, ear pressure. If the ear pressure is coming from an ear issue, then that is triggering the migraine, then you know you have to work with the ENT doctor to treat the ear issue that's causing the ear pressure. I have an interesting question that we got online. Um, do you believe most neurologists believe diet modification is effective for vestibular migraine? And if so, um, do they not recommend diet changes more often because they don't think patients will actually implement the changes? So hard to say what people believe, right? Okay. I think the main, a lot of the issues that we have, you know, where, where there's a lot of um, disagreement yeah is we think of things as you know black and white right so like in medicine a lot of people think oh the non-medication type of uh, you know treatments like supplements like diet mm -hmm. they don't work medications work best and of course you have another wing that says medications are bad bad yeah they don't don't take them they got all side effects they'll make you sicker yeah just supplements and diet right the answer is both Right? Supplements can work, diet can work, medications can work. Who goes for what? You decide. You're the ones who has to take the uh, medication. You're the one who has to be on the supplements. You're the one who has to be on the diet, right? So some of my patients, they say, all right, I want to try the supplements. I want to try the diet first. If, fa if it fails at three, four months, then we talk about medications. Perfectly fine. No problem, yeah. right? I have some like you know who say, "Oh, my symptoms are terrible. I don't want to even waste time with that. Uh, just waiting. I want to do the medications, do the supplements, do the diet all at once." Is that wrong? No. No. Perfectly just hard. fine. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a little hard. But I do see like you know there are a lot of neurologists also. I see the printouts that they give. You know they talk, do talk about dietary triggers and all that yeah. too. So I think things are a little changing. You know it's not you know one or the other. I think the answer is both. Yeah. And there's also different diets who can fit different lifestyles as Absolutely. well. Like where someone may not be able to do a full-on elimination without feeling restricted. Yep. Maybe a Mediterranean migraine diet would be a better fit. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Do you see it specifically help for a vestibular migraine or just is it all the same? You know, I, I sometimes I notice that diet changes tend to help more of vestibular people. And I'm not sure why that is. I think both. Okay. From, yeah, I think both. It can help with both. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. I didn't know if that was maybe Meniere's crossover or something ah, like that. Could be. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, Meniere's could, can benefit from a low sodium diet as well. Low so, caffeine, no yeah. chocolate, low sodium. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I wonder if we're more sensitive to caffeine too. They are. Meniere's. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Even vestibular migraine? Ha yep, half of people with uh, Meniere's have migraine. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, this, is, this might be a question I can't answer. For someone that has chronic migraine, when do you advise to start the reintrodu reintroduction phase? Um, if I'm on an elimination, heal your headache diet. Generally, if you're in chronic migraine, you're not seeing progress within like three to four months. Usually, I would say, you probably need to revisit with your neurologist. Um, diet changes can only help so much. So I think a lot of people rely on just diet and they're not seeing changes. And so if you're not really seeing any benefits from it, it could be a good time to reevaluate yep. that treatment with your physician too. Absolutely. I have seen some people who stick with it, myself included. Um, I really saw benefits about five to six months in. But if you're, and I think it's sometimes hard to see small changes too. Like I struggled with that as well. Um, I felt like I was making all of these changes in my life and it was overwhelming. And I was still having daily symptoms. But what I failed to realize was that after starting, I hadn't had a vertigo attack in months, whereas I used to get them pretty regularly. 
So I think it's a good thing to keep a journal um, so you yep. can note very small changes like, oh, today I didn't have to wear my migraine glasses because I didn't have as much light sensitivity or maybe I only had to do, you know, three extra stimulations of gamma core versus when yep. I used to use it all day long. And that, that's actually progress. Absolutely. Even if you're having symptoms yep. every day. So I think that's hard for us patients to see because we want to feel 100% better and we sometimes miss those little tiny changes yeah. too. The small victories. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys. So, Thank pleasure. You. Thank you.